What we now intend to do is to fix these said buffer fighting by making sure that the bottom of the building blocks is co-aligned to the surface of the landscape. And also in a succeeding step, we also want to make sure that the roofs or the top surfaces of these building blocks have a different color than the facades here, so as to make them distinct. Both of these endeavors can be quite easily realized in Grasshopper. So we'll start Grasshopper either by typing Grasshopper or clicking this icon here. I will wait for all the plugins to load. All right, with Grasshopper open, let's make sure that we can position this a little to the right here, perhaps. Make sure to realign or repo make sure to reposition the viewport here a little. All right, the first node I'm going to add here is called Bifocals. That is only to make this is a plugin uh, called Bifocals. It only makes sure that you see the names of the nodes and not only the icon, uh, the node, the node icons. The first thing that we're going to do is to reference the breps that we intend to use um, here. And for for this particular use case, it's quite easy because it's all of the um, building blocks we have here. Since we're going to adjust the bottom surface so as to extend uh, far beyond the surface of the landscape, uh, so as to easily be able to split away those parts and leaving a nice co-aligned bottom surface uh, for the individual building blocks, we actually do not need to reference this uh, landmark or uh, specifically we should not reference this because the difference in essence between the landmarks and the building blocks is that the building blocks are extruded surfaces and uh, as such there is no overhang and there is no harm in uh, redefining this and using the bottom uh, the bottom surface and the top surface uh, and uh, uh, manipulating the height of these so as to uh, make new geometry from them. But if one would reference the landmarks here, you see that perhaps this uh, top here, this roof here, it extends uh, beyond the constraints of the cylinder here. And thus it is an overhang. And uh, if one would change, if one would uh, manipulate this object with the definition that we're going to author here, that would lead to an erroneous uh, geometry being generated. So for this step, we will exclude this landmark and treat it separately. One can see here that it's uh, already extended below the surface of the landscape and thus it is eligible for the splitting uh, procedure afterwards. We'll just do that separately. All right, so we can, if we double click on the bar here, we can make sure to select all the surface objects of the building blocks like that. And then we double click to extend this again. And then we reference multiple breps. We set multiple breps as this. Very good. And now we see that these are all referenced, these building blocks. And uh, the first thing that we should do is to make sure that we get uh, the individual faces of these brep polysurfaces. So we can do that with deconstruct rep. There we have it. And we'll drag from the rep reference to the deconstruct rep here. And here we see that uh, the reps are deconstructed into its constituent parts, uh, faces, edges, and vertices. And we are interested in the, in the faces here. We want to evaluate the normal direction. The normal is always perpendicular to the surface tangent. Uh, so if we take, let's see if we can zoom in on this here. We see that the top surface here of this building block is uh, aligned, is co-aligned to the xy plane. Its normal direction is thus z positive. At the same time, the bottom surface of it, somewhere around there, the bottom surface of it is also co-aligned to the xy plane, 
but its normal direction is pointing below because it's outward facing the object has an outside and an inside and the normal direction is the direction uh, of its outside of its exterior and it's always perpendicular to the tangent of the surface itself uh, and for this let's see here if we switch back to random and for this particular use case uh, all the surfaces here are really uh, easy to evaluate the normal of because they are all planar. No matter if the third point is straight up or any other direction, they are all planar surfaces. And as, the, and as such, a planar surface, the, what uh, constitutes a planar surface is that the normal direction of the whole surface is the same. And then again, these building blocks are, co are composed of uh, several surfaces uh, and are, this, are as such a polysurface. But the individual surfaces that the polysurface consists of are all planar. All right, uh, but we still want to get, uh, we want to get a point here to evaluate uh, the surface normal on. And to do that, the easiest thing is to uh, calculate the area of the face. Calculating the area of the face will give the area, which is of no interest to us, but it, it will also give the centroid of the area the point that is in the middle of the surface area. And we can use that in our surface evaluation here. So we'll get, um, we'll create a node here called surface closest point. We see it there. And if we reference surfaces, and here we reference all the individual faces of the original breaths, and then we take the centroid point here as the input points, then since the input points is a centroid of the area of the faces and the faces are all planar then of course <laughs> then of course the centroid point will be on the surface and the closest point on the surface from the input point here will be the same but in this way we will get the uv point parameter here uh, the uv coordinates of that point which we could not have extracted immediately and now we are ready to evaluate this surface so as to uh, extract the normal value of it. So we'll evaluate surface and we'll see it here. And the surface in point is of course the original surface here or the original face of the imported polysurfaces. And then we get as a UV parameter or UV point, we'll get the parameter for the sample point uh, of the centroid here. All right, and knowing that we should input several more here, we can put this a little on the top here. And to move everything uh, on one side of an edge here, we can hold Alt and click. And you see here, if you can tap Alt, you toggle the separation direction. So we'll tap it again. And then we can move everything here and move it a little below here. Very good. And now, uh, now we have extracted the normal value here. We can temporarily make a panel here. And we can see here that these are all the normal directions of the sample points here. And a normal direction of, these are of course in X, Y, Z vector uh, format. So we see it as it's zero, zero, 001. That means that it points straightly up. That should be the top surface. And here in the last index, we see zero, zero, minus 001. That means that it, the normal points uh, straight down that means that it's the bottom surface and all of these have no uh, direction whatsoever in the in the z axis uh, but instead they point at different direct directions in, in x and y directions here so those are our uh, facades there and to make sure that we only reference uh, the surfaces or the faces of the polysurfaces that have a normal direction of Z1 that is pointing straight up, we could use a, a component or a node called dot product. And dot product, uh, what it does is to simply compare two vectors. And uh, if the vectors are the same, the dot product product will be one. If uh, the vectors are pointing straight away from each other, 180 degrees from each other, then the dot product will be minus one. And then for all uh, the values uh, there in between, it will be a value, uh, the dot product will be a value of between minus one and uh, one. 
with uh, uh, with zero being uh, that one of the two vectors are uh, perpendicular from the other. So if you would compare the tangent to the normal, you would always get zero. And if you would compare the normal with itself, it should always be one. And if you would compare the top surface with the bottom surface, that would be minus one as well. We can actually try this out just to demonstrate this. So if we take list item and make sure that this is set integer to zero, very good. That means that we reference the first in the list here. And then we'll make a copy. If you click and drag and then uh, tap Alt, you will make a copy. And then we can change the integer here to 5, to index 5. You see here, index 0, index 5. Then we can evaluate these two, and this should be minus 1. And it is minus 1 for the first branch there. That was the one that we were interested in. Uh, very good. If we change this to 0. So let's make sure that these reference the same index. And if we change from the normal to the uh, v, to the tangent, then this should be zero. Yes, because they are perpendicular. All right, but that was only demonstration. Uh, let's get rid of these as well as this. Uh, the dot product here, it should be the normal direction compared for all these normal values compared to the said direction. That means that if we uh, make a panel here, and if you check this, you see that you see that uh, the first one it was one. They are co-aligned. The world z-axis vector and the normal vector of this first indexed face of this polysurface are co-aligned. And you see that this is according to our expectation from our previous demonstration. And you see that all of the, uh, I call them facade, all the facade uh, surfaces are perpendicular to the top as well as to the bottom surface, of course. Uh, all right. And what we now want to make sure is simply that we, we only reference the faces that have a dot product between the normal value and the world Z vector of one. And why we could do this uh, by checking for equality those equality checks might be susceptible to tolerance errors, so it is advisable to instead do a larger than check here. So let's check if this dot product uh, factor here, if that is larger than, let's say, 0 0.99. And that means that in, if we check this with a panel here, we can see here that if it's uh, if the vector or sorry if the dot product is larger than 0 0.99, that means that it's highly probable that it is one. And here we see that this gets this gets sorted as true, while the others are false because they are not larger than 0 0.99. Very good. We can use a dispatch command here, or a dispatch node here. And then the original list should be these original faces. And the pattern that we should dispatch from should be this. That would mean that uh, what gets in the A output here is everything that is true. And what is, gets in the B output here is everything that is false. And uh, for this particular case, we are only interested in the roofs so as to demonstrate this. So we can type uh, either geometry or anything else which could contain these rep surfaces. And then we can see here, highlighted in green, that now we have only referenced the top surfaces here. We can double check this in perhaps wireframe mode so that not the bottom surface is selected. Very good. We can also uh, check here by preview only selected geometry. And we see here that we have all the roofs. Very good. We can change back to uh, the shaded view mode instead of the rendered view mode. All right. Uh, very good. Let's make sure that this is a little... Uh, because we are going to use the uh, dot product here for several use cases, but one should be the upwards pointing Z direction and one the other one should be the negative, the downwards facing. Uh, 
So here we have sorted uh, out the roof from the facades and as well as the bottom surfaces. Uh, but now we should do like this, because we are interested in what we aim to do is not only to sort them out, it's, it's also to actually regenerate all these building blocks uh, geometries, but with slightly manipulated Z values. So we can do like this then. I'll delete some of these panels, they have had their demonstrative purposes. And then uh, we should make sure to get the bottom surface. And the bottom surface we can get by simply having the same uh, Z world Z unit and uh, making sure that this is uh, the negative one. So instead of Z positive, it's a Z negative. And we can actually make sure that this can make sure that this is part of a lower branch here, and then we can create a up an upper branch here. So I'll uh, I'll duplicate the dot product node here by holding, clicking, and dragging, and tapping Alt, and then there, and then instead of the instead of the uh, positive set vector, we can have the negative set vector. Very good. This should also be a larger than node, so I can copy that. And we can make sure that this is referencing that instead. And uh, they should actually be using the same. So I'll hold Alt and expand this a little. So I can put this in the middle here. So now we have one lower branch that is uh, checking whether the surface is topwards facing. And another branch here that is checking if it's downwards facing. Very good, and uh, the only thing that we're interest, interested in for the bottom here is actually its uh, said position. We do not need to reference the surface or the face at all. And the said position, since uh, everything here is planar surfaces, uh, and for the bottom uh, we know that uh, since it's um, co-aligned to the xy plane, we know that every point on the face has the same said value. And thus the centroid also has the same Z value as the face as a whole. So we can dispatch these centroids by the same logic that we previously did for the uh, roofs here. We can dispatch all of these centroids. We can actually, if we type in geometry here, we can make sure that now we only have the, uh, and it's not very visible here in the shaded view mode, but if we change to wireframe, we see that now we have the bottom center, the bottom surface area centroids for all the downwards facing faces. Very good, change back to shaded. And with this information of the, uh, the points, we can deconstruct, because every point is consisting of an x, y, and z value, thus determining its location. But we can deconstruct that x, y, z data, and then we can reconstruct it, or construct point there, very good. And we are only interested in manipulating the z value, so the x value should be the same, the y as well. But we are interested in making sure that the Z value extends further beyond uh, by a quite massive amount, so as to make sure that the splitting operation that we will, will be do soon enough uh, is as effortless as possible for us in terms of manual work. Uh, so we'll subtract, subtract here, or otherwise you can simply type the minus sign, I think, yes. <gasps> And then we'll subtract there and make sure that this is the output or that the input of the set value for the construct point node is the output of the subtraction. And then perhaps we can, uh, uh, sub and by subtracting the set value, uh, we um, move the point uh, downwards in the set direction and we can move it down by 150 meters. That is an excessive amount, but here it is no here it is of no signif significance if it's excessive or not. The main point is that it should be sufficient enough. All right. And now you see here that all of these points have been uh, moved very very far below, and that makes it easy for us to then select the surface that has been extruded below here. 
Very good. We can delete that unnecessary node there, as well as making sure that this is a little lower there. Very good. And now that we have uh, pinpointed or uh, manipulated so that we have a bottom height for all of these uh, building blocks, then we should proceed with the top surfaces here. So let's move these. And actually the, this uh, move node here, it is by all means uh, no uh, necessary thing. Uh, because as you know, this is the uh, CC attribution dataset. So this is uh, uh, courtesy of or authored by a Stockholm municipality. And that should be noted since it's published with a CCBY attribution license. But it, uh, it is defined as the top surface being the talk foot, being the lowest point of the roof. Uh, so that is something to take in mind. If you would like to like the, uh, the public domain open dataset has been where, the, where it is the mean height of the roof that is the actual uh, top surface here. Then you would perhaps, uh, let's say here, one and a half meters or so. You you make uh, this um, you make this call, of course. And then you could make sure that let's make sure that these are a little more. As you see here, if we zoom in here, you see that now you are able to move the top surface here, so as to be able to yourself define whether you want if you define this as zero then no change in said height for the top surface is made and that means that it's talk foot and you could uh, potentially uh, increase this value to something you deem reasonable enough. I think that for this particular example we'll leave it at the talk foot but this, uh, this, uh, these three nodes are there simply to make sure that you are able to uh, manipulate that. And with the surface at the, at the Z height that you have defined as reasonable, you take the area of that. So as to get, let's see here, you take the area of that, of those, so as to get the centroid point there. And with the centroid point there, as well as the centroid point here, you have now in a, a synchronized data set or a synchronized... Um, data tree structure so that uh, since everything stems from the same faces this top surface centroid and this uh, manipulated bottom surface centroid they are each uh, each data entry is in the same hierarchy as the other one here uh, so we can simply make a vector two points two points there I think this. And this calculates the vector, the distance in all three axes from a certain point to another. And we are interested in actually extruding these uh, from the top uh, to the bottom here, since uh, it is a top surface that we have referenced uh, the face of. So we should make sure that the centroid of uh, the first input here should be A, or should be the uh, top surface centroid while the B value, the second value, the second input here, should be the bottom surface centroid that we have manipulated here. Very good. And now we have the vector uh, defining the distance from each of these faces, uh, top surface centroid to the manipulated bottom one. Very good. And uh, with this vector, now we already have the vector, so we can actually simply take our top surface here and extrude. And the geometry that we want to extrude is these, and the distance with which we want to extrude them is this vector, or these vectors. So now we have here, and you, you might uh, think that it's uh, silly, uh, to extend so long, but it is only to make the next step easier for us in, with the manual work. Uh, and you can see that now you can uh, um, visually preview. So if you decide that you want to increase the height here, uh, why would you would increase by 7.7 .7 meters, I do not know. But uh, perhaps if you want to extend it one meter so as to make it more resembling the mean height of the roof instead of being the lowermost point for all. 
uh, then you could do that. But for this example, we will not be doing that. With these sets of nodes, you have uh, roughly everything you need for this step at least. And now we can simply, uh, we can either you make sure beforehand that you have a suitable layer structure, or uh, as I often do, uh, you can uh, make uh, you can make do with the layer structure after exporting or after baking here. We can bake the geometry here by right clicking on an output and bake. Then you can make sure to bake yes please as a group. That will make it easy to select uh, as well. And then we can simply bake it to the zero layer here. Okay, you have it grouped. Very good. I'll double click here to, so as to minimize the grass overview here. And now having all of these here, very good. We can make another layer here, which can be called manipulated, manipulated buildings. And it should be it actually could be one here, but I think that we should make one that is building blocks as well as one that is landmarks. All right, but these are all building blocks. So let's change the layer, change these objects to the building blocks layer, and then we can hide that. Very good. And now you see that, uh, or perhaps not at this stage, but we have effectively rendered these, uh, this, uh, these previous uh, geometries uh, obsolete. So we could either temporarily hide them or permanently delete them. That is up to you. Uh, I'll hide this there. Very good. And show this. Very good. And now with these here, what we want to do is to make sure that this landscape, oh sorry, uh, this landscape layer is uh, locked here. So make sure to unlock it and make sure that the surface that we have here is a single surface, only the top surface, the one that, actually, that is actually the actual landscape, and to make sure that it is a surface, that it is a brep, and not a mesh, uh, because uh, with a mesh you cannot split breps with. Very good, so now we can simply select this group, and either you ungroup it now at this stage or at a later stage, but be sure not to forget that these are grouped, because these will be split now with the landscape uh, with the landscape surface here and having done so we want to deselect or we want to uh, only make sure to uh, delete the ones below uh, the landscape and if the if they are grouped then that group is persevered uh, beyond the splitting so they will be split but they will still be grouped so i think it's prudent to ungroup these now very good now these are ungrouped and now we can with control shift s or typing split we can split all of these with this landscape surface and enter or space to confirm and allow it to split it will of course take some time And with full transparency here, I think that it was a mistake to uh, make this an ordinary split because uh, if you split a closed solid uh, polysurface uh, with a surface or with uh, anything that can split it, uh, the splitting command will not yield closed polysurface results. If you split a solid you will get a hollow. <laughs> no, but if you split a solid, you will get an open polysurface. Uh, so I would, uh, and depending on your usage, you might not need closed solid polysurfaces for your particular uh, scenario. But uh, I think it is prudent to make sure that these are uh, closed polysurfaces so as to make sure to be able to fabricate them uh, with a 3D printer, uh, perhaps if you leave these uh, top surfaces flat, then they can be easily fabricated upside down, so as to make sure that they have a flat uh, a roof, but then the, the bottom will be curved according to the landscape, and if the landscape is uh, fabricated perhaps with a CNC, with a CNC machine, with a tight enough tolerance, uh, then you could easily reposition the 3D printed upside down models upside down on the model where they belong. So I'll actually undo the split command here. Sorry for that. And type in boolean split. The boolean split 
is uh, very good in that case that uh, as long as your input is closed polysurfaces, your outputs will be as well. And thus we can, having activated the command, select the surface, press space or enter to confirm, and then allow it, uh, it makes uh, these uh, splitting commands again, but makes sure that what you get is closed polysurfaces as well. Now, as you are perhaps aware of, Boolean commands can take an awful lot of time, so make sure not to rush it. It's also, a, um, if not a single cell operation, then it's a, a very uh, few thread operation. So just make it, just allow it to... Oh! And <laughs> yeah, and it took some time there. Uh, I thought that it was actually done, but uh, now it is done. <gasps> All right, so allow it to finish. Very good. Uh, including or um, keeping the 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 closed polysurfaces as closed polysurfaces, of course, means that the complexity of the individual objects are increased in as in relation to uh, just simply splitting and uh, not having a bottom surface at all, simply having an edge go aligned to the surface. But it is up to you, depending on your usage case. Uh, right now, we demonstrated both of them. Um, and here, I think it's actually easiest if we simply deselect and then to select from here here. And now there is no easy way to make sure that you have selected it correct here, but we think that is correct here. Yeah, I would say so. Let's delete this. Very good, they are deleted. And as to our understanding, the result is as we want. We can of course check this if you had kept the original data or the original building block series in another layer. You can see if it pops up something. No, I would say that they are all kept here. Very good. Let's keep that layer hidden. And uh, uh, having done so for the building blocks here, and you see that in some cases, or in those cases where there are multiple elements on top of each other, the extrusion here, uh, there is nothing necessary with having this element extruded all the way to the landscape and having that uh, complex uh, meeting there. One could simply take this type Boolean difference and then make sure to. Uh, delete this uh, or use this as the uh, as the boolean input for deletion for deleting uh, those parts that are those parts that are intersecting all right and i think the same is for this one so boolean difference very good all right and we saw this here as well boolean difference and as of now, we keep this as separate. If one would like, one can of course uh, select both these and type Boolean union. That will make sure that this is one closed solid polysurface instead. But uh, that does not uh, reduce the complexity of the model, uh, rather increasing it, uh, since we now have this interior border here as well. I'll delete that, or I'll undo that operation so as to keep it so. Uh, all right, and as we previously stated, the landmarks are treated um, separately due to uh, what we saw here, that we don't want to extrude all of these elements down uh, far below the landscape and then to split them and to, because that will make uh, this roof uh, extending all the way down here. But what we can do here is take this this and these two, these four elements which are actually uh, intersecting with the ground here, with the landscape, and type boolean. Should we split or, yeah, we should split of course, because uh, we could, uh, if the landscape would be a closed solid polysurface as well, then we could have uh, um, applied the command 
Boolean difference, but now since this is only a paper thin uh, surface, then it could not have made a Boolean difference operation. But they can, but it can still be used for a splitting operation. Very good. Uh, and now with this, we can control and alt deselect these ones and delete what is hidden underground. Very good. It in rendered. Make sure that building blocks. Yeah, these should be, of course, in the landmarks here. They could be changed or copied. I would prefer it to be changed so as not to increase the file size unnecessarily. All right. Uh, we can hide the attribution data as the landmark was now changed. We can. All right, now we have fixed the said fighting, uh, the said fighting issue here. As you can see, and you see that the artifacts here are only a preview artifact. If you actually make a render, you see that you actually uh, have a, an adequate result or at least uh, adequate in terms of what we previously did for this. All right, uh, we could actually put a stop to this tutorial here, but since we will be using the same grasshopper definition for the next part as well, we can simply integrate it here as well. So we'll open the grasshopper script here, the definition. We will be using uh, a part of this, but not all of it. Uh, Right now, you see that we still have the previous uh, selection set referenced here, but we want to make sure that we have the new selection set here. So we can get all the sublayer of the manipulated buildings here, select sublayer objects, very good. And now open this and set multiple breps. Okay, one thing to really take note of is that the area calculation here uh, of these closed polysurfaces bottom bottom phase where the phase is uh, is directly derived from the topography of the landscape that took an awful amount of time so my suggestion is to uh, not make the same mistake as i did here uh, and disable this you if you select any node and then you press down the middle mouse button you get this sort of uh, compass and then you can disable the selected objects and that will of course make uh, all the nodes that are uh, dependent on that on that disabled node to be inactive or uh, state an error here uh, but let's make sure that we don't calculate the area for all of those so perhaps, uh, let's see, give me some time to think here. So one, one way to avoid the calculation of these non-planar surfaces for the faces that are derived from the landscape topography and incur a very long delay for this node. Here the output is a face and that is a brep as well. So we can deconstruct, no not deconstruct, we can take the brep edges the brep edges and if we take these faces and uh, let's make some room here take these brep edges and the naked edges that is those that are constituting a border uh, we can perhaps take the start is it start or end points end points end points yes we can take these naked edges and now we get all the start and end points of all the edges that are constituating the faces of the deconstructed brep. All right, but we don't want all of them. And now since I selected this uh, uh, brep node uh, that references all of these uh, complex meshes, it took some time to uh, generate preview meshes or render meshes for those, that preview. We also lost the grasshopper window, but we can simply alt tab to another uh, window and then alt tab back and it's back. Very good. Uh, that was by mistakenly selecting this and uh, uh, 
telling Grasshopper or Rhino to uh, generate those render meshes, those preview meshes for the breps that we have referenced here. That took some time. And uh, here we have the brep edges, as you see, and here we have the end points of those brep edges of the deconstructed faces. And we only want one sample here, so we can take list item. And we'll take the starting point of these end points. And now, since it's only index zero, we only get uh, the first of these 735. And and 735 is the same amount of faces here. So those two have the same structure, data structure. Very good. Then we can, instead of uh, uh, manually dragging these connections here, we can hold Control and Shift and relocate those from the previous node, which was very, which was good enough for totally planner polysurfaces, but uh, when we got uh, more complex surfaces, it took very long time. So we can control and shift and drag these and release them there. And you see that took no time. Very good. Uh, and uh, you doing this might not be like uh, if you use the area, you make sure that you get the center point, which is a must for the extrusion. I think now there will be no, yeah, there will only be two extruded objects here. <laughs> that was the only one that got extruded here. Yeah, but we will not be using the extrusion, the extrude component here. Uh, but one thing to keep that in mind, that you will need the area here to use the area if you want to manipulate the said heights of the building's top and bottom surfaces, uh, as we previously did. I think that we will supply two versions of this, one for extruding and one for simply separating the roofs from the facades. All right, but this is good enough for this. Uh, and here we have, as you remember, this is still moved by zero, so we can see here. And we see that we have, I think that this is actually referenced as well. Let's see if the... No, actually it might not be, because right now we have a... Um, you see here that we have a cutoff value of 0 0.99. That means that only if the face if the normal direction of the face is aligned to the said world direction, the said positive world direction, only then will it be treated as roof. But as you see, this roof is definitely a roof, but it's not a uh, planner. So we can decrease this cutoff value. Yeah, and thereby 85, it was included as well. The main point is to not decrease this so as to include other faces as well. I think if this is zero, then yeah, you see. So uh, let's make sure that this was 0 0.85. 0 0.85. Very good. Then we get that roof included as well. This looks like it might be of some problem. I will check this. Ah, here's the culprit. Here's the culprit. Here's the culprit. Here's the culprit. And if we check here with a panel, we see that the structure here, it's three paths. And in the, the path uh, C here, it's got lots of branches as well as in path B. And let's see, in path A, there is no branches at all. That's a common branch. So, and if we check here, I think that the structure is another one. Yes, it's only path A and B. And that makes this uh, uh, erroneous. So let's make sure that both of these are simplified. So let's simplify the tree. Aha. So here's the culprit. They, they do not share the same data structure. Uh, we will need to make sure that they share the same data structure. Actually, you see here that this has, uh, it has two paths path A, path B. In path A, everything is shared. It's zero all the way, only one, in the, only one index, index zero, uh, only one branch. And then in path B here, we have 96 branches. And here we see that things have gotten a little shifted. Uh, so instead of simplifying this, which I think is not necessary, no, exactly, we should shift this, I think it's shift paths. Let's see here, if I shift these paths, 
0, 0, 0, 8 to 2. Yes, shift paths. Okay, so this simplified tree was wrong. Let's control shift on there. Now let's see if we still have that deep green hue here. No, now everything looks as uh, one would expect. Okay, so I'll delete this panel as well as this panel and this erroneous simplified tree here. So the matter at hand was that when we changed from simply measuring the area to uh, these one, two, three nodes, these three nodes changed the data structure, expanding it or uh, adding another path, uh, path C in this case, while this only had path A and B. Uh, but having this shift paths node, uh, like we saw previously. Here we have three paths, and here it's returned to the original two paths, as is here as well. Very good. So we simply needed to make sure that uh, the data structure that was created by these three nodes was uh, realigned to the original data structure, so that the succeeding components could, uh, could function correctly. Very, very good. Then, have, having made sure now that this is not of the darker gray hue and that everything looks correctly, we can now simply do like this. First, uh, we can actually, in this case, we can first make sure that the layer hier hierarchy is ready for us. So I'll double click here. We have manipulated buildings. We can actually have a new one here that's called... I think that we can call these actually separated buildings because they are separated. Uh, in terms of having the roofs separated from the rest of the build. Very good. And then we can add a sublayer of roofs and a new sublayer of the parent layer here called. Um, I'll call them facades, knowing that they also contain the bottom. But the bottom surface is for visualiz visualization of no concern. And for 3D printing, it is uh, not in any way texture based. So I think it's good. It's okay. All right. With the with the layer structure finished there, we can expand this again, and now we can simply bake the roofs here to the roofs layer. They do not need to be grouped thus. Very good. And then uh, when it's, it comes to the uh, facades here, uh, I think it is prudent to first join these reps. Rep join. Very good, and now it uh, will take some time to uh, generate those preview meshes since we clicked on it so as only to <laughs> change its location slightly. Very good, and now you know that you can Alt-Tab and Alt-Tab back, and now we have them already generated. We can right-click here on the output and bake them to the facades. Very good, I'll double-click here to minimize this. Oh, but it's uh, still baking, sorry. Let's make sure to wait out the baking command. All right, we lost the grasp window. I'll just Alt-Tab and Alt-Tab. Very good. We have already baked these out though, so we can minimize this by double-clicking. And then we can uh, hide the manipulated buildings layer. We see that we lost no information there. And now we should, let's see here, we should see here that if I select, or perhaps if we uh, disable the visibility of the facades here, we only have the roofs here. I find it a little confusing as to the whole of that being a roof, but I think that it is because it's part of that, so I am fine with that. Uh, all right. And then we can simply uh, very, very quickly assign a layer material here. You see in the material column here, you can simply click there and then you can change to a new material and a paint material and we can reduce the glossiness to matte and change the color. Perhaps by clicking here we can go up and then perhaps to light gray and click OK. And now you see that the U has changed for the facades. And then we click on the roofs layer here, so as to assign a layer material for the roofs. Use a new material, a paint, and reduce the glossiness, and click here. And then we can perhaps make these black. And click OK. 
Was that two black? Perhaps, perhaps there? Okay. And now you see here that we have separated the roofs from the rest of the building. And uh, uh, in the preview here, it looks, uh, you see these edges of the uh, adjoining color, uh, which is a little confounding. But uh, rest assured, when you render out, these artifacts will not appear. I think that it is reasonable to stop this tutorial here. Thank you for your time.